All right, as you can see, as we're all coming back together, we're still working on this Google Drive, and we apologize that it's taken us a while. We're right, gonna get so, there. But like we said, it's our first time. Um, go ahead and wave at me or give me a thumbs up or drop it in the comments if you're back so we know we can go ahead and get started. Got everybody back in. Jumping in, jumping in. All right, Miss Kimberly's back. Miss Ann's back. Now what? Oh, Miss Cindy's back. Now, is Garrett your first or last name? It's my last name. Okay. That was my email. It's Garrett underscore D. The D is for Debbie. Oh, well, hi, Miss Debbie. Hello. Y'all are doing a great well, job, love. Well, thank you. We're hoping that maybe we can do a few more of these. That's one of the good things about Corona coming out of nowhere is we've been forced to find new ways to do things. And some of these virtual workshops are kind of nice, especially because I think next year we're going to be able to work with just science folks and just ELA folks. So that way you can get a better experience for your PD as well. Right. So I need I need ELA more than science. I taught science for two years, sixth grade science, no, for three years. And now I'm back in seventh grade ELA. And so I'm thinking as you're doing this, I'm thinking, how can I use this in my ELA? Because we have well, a right. we have Well, good. We're, I'm sorry. I missed that in the comments earlier, but that's one thing uh, Lee is about to touch on is some ELA stuff. So that's good. she'll be right back. Okay. So All right. you let me get out the way. Google Drive. Can y'all hear me if I yell from over here? All right. I got a yes. All right. So if you are on your Google Drive, I'm still working on getting things into these folders. So the folders, yeah, they may or may not be loaded. But if you look right down here and you see this one that says sixth through eighth grade, this is actually our sixth through eighth grade curriculum. And I'm going to go ahead and download that because we are actually doing some stuff out of there right now. Right now, right now. I didn't catch that one. Hold, hold what you got. I'm trying to. All right, go ahead. So I'm right here. Oops, that's Laura's. Okay, I'm right here. Okay, that's Laura's. Okay, I'm right here. And I'm going to go back to where I was. And if you're in your Ag in the Classroom lessons, which is right here, I'm down here in the one that says sixth through eighth grade PDF. And I'm pulling it up right now. All right, give them a minute. I see some eyes trying to get where you're at. All right, so that, that's where you should be. It's a big old PDF. It's about 236 pages. Looks like that. At least I got that on there. Too. Yeah, the folders are kind of empty, but I've got that. All right, we ready to roll? Give me some thumbs up if you're ready. Thumbs up if you're ready or thumbs up if you don't care and just want us to get on with it. <laughs> hey, they got a lot. <laughs> All right. So in this one, this is our actual sixth through eighth grade curriculum. Hey, what tub is that or what folder are we in right now? We are in my share, whatever, and it's on their, their curriculum CD. And it's on their curriculum CD too, so. Hopefully we can come off download it again. Where'd it go? Oh, they can totally see this. All right, so we are right here in the sixth through eighth grade curriculum CD. And if you'll notice, it's got 230 something pages. Let me let Laura come on there where she, you can see that. And so with these 236 pages, if you will notice, this was the actual one that we did as a, the that Tennessee Farm Bureau actually did. And it's got all the lessons right here in the front and it's divided by actual subject matter. Now, disclaimer, these little page numbers are accurate, but the standards that it's listed under may actually have changed over the years. This, this is getting a little bit older, but if you'll notice, it's got health, language arts, 
math, social studies, science, and then it goes into the activities. And so if you are an ELA teacher and you want to go over here, tell me, what grade do you teach ELA? What, what's your ELA grade? I don't, I wasn't watching the video, so I don't know who I'm talking to. But somebody seventh. said they were ELA. Seventh grade. What'd she say? Is it seventh. Debbie? The seventh. seventh. Okay, so let's go through the language arts real quick and see what grade level it's got on it. I may or may not be doing these activities. Oddly enough, one of the activities I'm doing today is from seventh grade ELA, and it's language page eight. So we're going to scroll on down. It starts with health and it goes all the way down to your other subjects. Allow. And so right here is the language section. And so this particular activity right here, I'm just pulled up this management myth one. But if you'll notice, this is an actual activity about forestry, wildlife, and fisheries, and it's called management myths. And notice, it's language arts, eighth grade. So I'm sure that you could integrate that into a language arts, seventh grade, because once again, if you're like us, you just integrate it wherever. You know, you just roll on with your business. But notice, this has got supporting information on all of them. It kind of gives you a description of the lesson. Students create posters and write essays on the misconceptions about forestry. You know, if you're right here in Murray County, forestry is really not your jam. But if you are in Wayne County, Perry County, uh, oh, it's Perry County in the house. I'd be doing this activity tomorrow in Perry County because forestry and and you know the lumber business and the trees that's a big part of Perry County's industry, as is Wayne County. I did a workshop in Clifton. I bet I passed five log trucks coming out of Clifton. East Tennessee, and you're like, where in the world's Clifton? Well, if you're from Wayne County, you know where Clifton is, and that might be a big deal. If you're in Cock County, if you're in, uh, you know, Johnson County, it may be actually a big business or closer to a big business up there if you're doing forestry. And so you'll notice it's got divide the class into cooperative learning groups, assign one misconception card to each group, give the group a layer sheet, and invite a professional to talk to you after you do the activity. Now I'm gonna go over here and scroll down the student sheet so you can actually see what you're looking at. And so you can actually see it's got, on these, it's got how to get started, what you need to do to print it. And by the way, I'm, are there any principals in the house? Any principals? Got any principals? Uh, uh. And by the way, this says, is it on the curriculum CD or Lee is my shared? It's on both. So you can find it wherever you want. Um, it's either. But if you are a, if you're a principal, close your ears because I'm about to give them trade secrets. Here is my, here's what I do when I get evaluated. First of all, my, our principles are social studies, marketing, and science. That's our three principles. Head principal is a former sixth grade science teacher and our other two are history. I always do a lesson that if they were one of my kids, they'd say, hey, that lesson is interesting, fun, and I got my objective across. And I cannot imagine getting evaluated in a science classroom and just doing a lecture. Because if you do stuff like this where your kids are engaged, your principals love it. Uh, a science way or a high school way of doing things is do a lesson they don't understand, and then they're like, woo, that was great. <laughs> hey, true story. <laughs> but if you can do a lesson and put yourself in a kid's shoes, this is something fun. So if you're making an activity and you're doing an ELA class, you know, they're probably coming to evaluate you thinking you're going to talk about some poetry or maybe reading a passage or whatnot. But you can go into this one. It's got vocabulary. And, you know, you think, well, these words are dumb. You might actually have a student that is not only an ELA student, but an English language learner in your classroom that may not understand what it means to browse. And so you could actually integrate those vocab words into your lesson. If you talked about a crown and you were me and Laura and talking about trees, we'd know that was the top of the tree. A kid might be like, what's a crown got to do with the tree? And so it's got student sheets that are vocab, and then it's got your misconceptions. Here's where you're getting into the science and engineering practice of arguing from evidence. And so this is an English language activity that also integrates a science activity. You could have your ag teacher come and talk. 
you could invite a forester to your room. They would love to come and talk about forestry. And you can actually do these lessons. So I don't want you all to think, because Laura and I are just science teachers, this is a big old fat science workshop. If you're a math teacher, same way. Go down to math. Let's go down to some mathy math. Let's see what we got. Can't remember if math comes before language or after, but I think math comes toward the end. Come on. Our computers are like, nope. There's a math. This is actually the lab I wanted. And is it under science? No, it is not. It is under math. So before we do this lesson, um, if you're a math teacher, this is maybe one that you could pull up. Now, I know talking about Punnett squares is very sciencey, but if you're in a younger grade, you could say, okay, I have four of you in a group. One of you has that trait. What percent of your group has that trait? And so they would say, well, one of four is 25%, which is a simple math skill for a younger math student. All right. So 25% of you have that trait, do you think it's dominant or do you think it's recessive? And then have them, you know, evaluate that. If you're with an older class, then you could do your mathematics any way you want. You could teach ratios, one to four. You could teach fractions uh, by doing your class. You could talk about sex linkage and see if more boys have it than girls or more girls have it, no boys have it. And so there's a way to integrate this one into math. And it said it's under math and again under science. Thanks, because I didn't remember it was under both. And so this is a lesson that we can actually integrate twice. Um, I talk to my math, I talk to my math teachers a lot when we're doing ratios of genetics in the high school level because I want kids to understand more like population data of genetics. So to, especially in AP Bio, like if I say, you know, in this class, 10% of you have blue eyes. Why does 30% of America have blue eyes? By the way, I just pulled that number up. And then we would talk about big groups compared to small groups. You can go into a statistic discussion, et cetera, because you know, if you sample a little group, your statistics probably aren't very accurate. If you sample a huge group, your statistics are more accurate. And I know nobody wants to teach evolution, but if you're teaching gene flow and whatnot in your science classes, this you could use this math component to go into that. All right, so. On human traits here, now Miss the lab on the So you might grab that so they can they kind of hold it up. Can they see it pretty good? So on this particular lab, after you've extracted DNA, then you can do a little discussion of genetics. And of course, it's got all sorts of traits right here that are selected for in different um, organisms. Let's see if I can make this just a little bit. There we go, there we go, there we go. All right, so if you look, you can see that with seed corn, you've got amount of sugar, because you know you got really, really sweet corn, or you know, if your granddaddy goes and gets you field corn, you're like, well, this isn't as good as peaches and cream sweet corn. Well, it's not, it's not bred to be really, really sugary. Whereas peaches and cream sweet corn is very, very sugary. Uh, if you're looking at the quantity of milk, if you've got Holsteins you're milking, you're gonna get way more pounds of milk than Jersey's. But if you're milking jerseys, you're going to get way more butter fat than you would on a Holstein. So if you're producing ice cream, then you want Mayfield because Mayfield, granted, I don't know how many jerseys are milked anymore, but you're like, oh, I want that high milk fat because I want lots of milk fat in my ice cream. Whereas if you're just pure milk production, you may go for a cow like a Holstein that's producing more milk. So it's got all sorts of traits on here where you can um, see the traits that are chosen for or selected for in critters. And then that leads me to the lab I'm going to show you. The lab I'm going to do today, which is both places, it's on my uh, folder and in your curriculum CD, is called Human Traits That Are Inherited. Now, disclaimer, and we'll do some disclaimer. 20 hundred years ago when I started teaching in 1992, it was a, I, I would do something like this and what think second thing about it. And so if I did this lab and didn't think anything about it, I would say, go home, um, ask your mama if she can do this, ask your daddy if they can do that, write it down, come let me know. Nowadays, it's not as easy as all that. 
um, you need to be very, um, what's the word, compassionate with regard to their home situation. And so if you're doing this particular lab nowadays, you want to be mindful of this when you ask kids about traits of their families. We have tons of students that don't live with mama, but live with daddy, they don't live with daddy, but live with mama, don't live with either mama, daddy, don't know mama, daddy, have never met grandmama, don't, you know, it's just a big, big difference. And so if you're doing earlobes, I've gotten away from, go home and ask your mom and dad if they have attached earlobes. You know, I might say, go look at one of your family members that you're close to and see if they have attached earlobes. Because you don't want to be the one that goes through this lab and just goes on and on and on and on about familiar relationships. And you've got a fourth grader that didn't realize they were adopted. That would not be good. And so be mindful of that as you're doing this lab. And I've gotten to where nowadays I just look at the student's traits and we talk about heredity. If it was AP biology, it's no big deal. If you're a senior in high school, you probably already know if you're adopted. But if you've got a younger clientele, it's pretty difficult to see. So on this one, we're going to do earlobes. I usually separate my boys and my girls. Number one, because high school boys act like heathens. And the girls already have their data on their chart all nice. And the boys are over there, you know, punching each other in the arm especially if they're freshmen, but see if they have attached earlobes or detached earlobes. If they have attached earlobes, they go right into their head. And so you could do them and their partner. Let them look at their lab partner. Got tongue rolling. This is an easy one. Can you roll your tongue? Mm -hmm. Then it's got right or left thumb. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm left thumbed, but I'm right arm. So if I just close my hands together, my left thumb goes on the top. That's a genetic trait that I got from my parents. And folks, you breed alligators, you get alligators. There's no way around it. And so you have to have gotten that trait from somewhere, which leads me to my discussion of Laura Pearl. So in case you haven't figured it out, Laura and I are co-teachers. Uh, we teach and share a prep room, but Laura was also one of my former students. Mm -hmm. And so I had Laura in high school. I was her high school biology two teacher. And I have you in anatomy biz? Okay. So I had her anatomy and physiology and spring semester blushing. I know, right? In spring <laughs> semester when high school kids have given up and don't curve. But we were doing blood typing. Now, when I had Laura, we probably poked our finger and got blood types. I mean, we didn't care. Nowadays, knit. I use um, synthetic blood from Carolina Biological, which is relatively inexpensive and doesn't have blood work patterns. But we were doing this particular thing and we were doing a Punnett square on blood types. Well, there's four blood types, O, A, B, and AB in this country. And O is the most common and AB is the least common. And I was like, well, if I have B and my husband has A, my kids could have A, B, AB, or they could have O if we happen to carry that OG. Laura was doing this lab and she's like, my mom's not my mom. She had her mom's blood type wrong. She thought her mom's blood type was well, one thing. I went to the point of asking my dad. Yeah. And my dad confirmed that I was right. <laughs> yeah. And my mom finally came up like, you're a bunch of crazies. Poor Laura. I mean, she was like freaking out. And I'm like, oh no, I've told the kid they were adopted and I didn't mean to. Ah! It was a big, it was a big to do. But, you know, if you're doing this with kids, be mindful of things about their family heritage. But that, that's a little funny from the Laura Pirtle. She's Laura Campbell then, Laura Campbell Files. She finally figured out that her mom's, she had her mom's blood type wrong. But um, as you go into this lab, it goes through spreading fingers. So can your kids spread their fingers? Can they not? It's got what I call the Eddie Munster, which I have realized kids don't know who Eddie Munster is now. And so I can't really use the Eddie Munster. So we look at the Wittes Peak. For some reason, that embarrasses the far out of kids. If they've got a Wittes Peak, it just, that's so embarrassing to them. Finger length. And you can do a whole range of activities. Um, we've got these on there, but there are hundreds and hundreds of human traits you can explore. As you go throughout these human traits, you go on down. This is the student sheet. And so with math, it's basically just got you doing a simple percent. If you look at your evaluation options, which are attached to every lab, it's got determine if a student can identify the traits by having them check out a person at school. Have them go to the principal and be like, hey, do you cross your left thumb or just cross your hands, principal? And they'll be like, oh, your left thumb's on top of your left thumb. And you, they can tell your principal, even if it's a third grader, hey, 
you had, that's a dominant trait based on our experimentation because if everybody except two kids has their left thumb on the top, that's probably a dominant trait. But then you can go into a discussion of some traits that don't suit that. Normal height is actually a recessive trait. Achondroplasia is a dominant trait, which is a capital A, which is genetic, a type of genetic dwarfism. So just because everybody's got it doesn't mean it's dominant. Number two, have them do percentages, include their family, calculate it based on your immediate family versus your grandparents, even work in a pedigree, and have them survey five classmates of the genetic traits they would seek in their favorite foods. Be like, if you had bananas, what would you favor? Well, I hate bananas with a passion, so I would be like, I would favor the not having to eat a banana trait. But kids might say, well, I love bananas, so I want it to be really long so I can have a lot of bananas. And some of them might say, well, I like them, but I don't want them really, really sweet. And some of them might say, well, I want them really, really mushy. That's when they get good, when they're mushy. And some people will be like, Chris Fleming, yeah, Chris Fleming. That's you, Chris Fleming. Chris eats rotten bananas and loves them. That's disgusting. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. The mushier, you know, the better. How about you, right, Chris? So disgusting. Is he there? Yeah, he's recording. So anyway. Or they could say, I like them really, really firm and not squishy. So talk about traits of, you know, back in the day, hamburger that you got may have looked a lot different than hamburger you get now. Uh, because now, and you don't think about it much until the coronavirus rolls through. And we have a good local butcher who used to teach here at Spring Hill High School, but he's got a PhD from, you know, in food science from K-State and uh, Casey. And Casey has a butcher shop downtown. And I love 80-20. That's my jam. I like a little fat in my hamburger. Or fat gives flavor. And I buy it a case at a time from Casey because he's an ag man, and I know he has good beef. I could not find 80-20 during coronavirus. You could find 93-7, and I'm like, I don't want 93-7. But some people might be like, I want it really, really, really lean. And I love 93-7. Leah likes a little fat in there because it gives her spaghetti sauce flavor. And so those are things you can talk about that have to do with genetics what animals are bred to do. You know, jerseys aren't bred to be really, really tall like Holstein because their goal is not tons of milk production. Their goal might be more of butter fat from the milk they do produce. Whereas Holsteins, they're huge. If you've never stood next to a Holstein cow, you know, two, three, four years old, that's a big beast. She's a big, tall animal. Why does she not have any fat on her? Because fat would equal her saving all her fat with her milk. You want her to be lean. Whereas if it's a beef cow, that might be raising calves for meat, you'd want them to be, you know, carrying a little more fat, carrying a little more muscle. Uh, Laura is not, her, her family milks jerseys. They're not like, well, I need a really, really muscular jersey. That's not their jam. That's not what they're breeding for. Whereas a beef producer would be like, I don't want anything that looks like the jersey in my herd because there's no muscle, we're selling meat. So that's where you talk about human traits versus traits that are animal traits. So there you go. So that's our discussion of genetics. So far, let's recap what we've done. We've done a mathematics lesson on how human traits are inherited. We've done a science lesson on how traits are inherited. We've done a cheek cell DNA lab where you've extracted DNA in a human cell. We've extracted DNA from a strawberry so that you could use bananas or peas or whatever you've got. And so those are basically our four activities that we do that are based on genetics. So does anybody have any questions about some of our genetics lessons that we've done today? Hopefully we've integrated about 50, 50, 60 ways you can use this. All right, so we're gonna put you on pause for just a minute because we're going at the, we're about at the halfway point. We're gonna mass our eggs real quick. See if we're gaining any mass or losing any mass. So we're gonna pause for just a second. We'll be right back with you after we get our eggs out of our solution. All right, we're in business. So halfway point, we're gonna look at our eggs. Now, let's refresh what our mass was. 70, about 76, about 86. Does that sound about right? It was 78.6 on water and 89.3 on the K-Row. Okay, so here's my K-Row. Where's that blue lid? Cause I messed it up, there we go. Grab that lid for me, Fargo. I use that as my kind right. of my hope. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to record for you. So give me a second to right. get that off the, get you off the thing. 
Alrighty, hold on, let me turn y'all around. Okay, here we go. All right, so we are going to, at the halfway point, mass our eggs. This point, you're gonna let your students hypothesize. This was our syrup egg. If we review, our syrup egg was 89.3 grams when we massed it to begin with. We've left it in syrup for, I don't know, about an hour and a half. Do y'all think, and put in the comments, that the mass is gonna be greater or less than it was? Higher or lower? No comments? Oh, nice, Anne. Anne is paying attention today. Anne is on the ball. Anne is my kid that sits up front and wants to clean off my boards when I'm done. That's right. Oh, Debbie is with me too. <laughs> oh yes <laughs> she is teacher's pet and she knows it she teacher's pet and she knows it this person said water diffused out of the egg and if you notice that egg has gone to 75 grams so we have lost at this point you're going to want to do your mass 89.3 minus now we're to 75 grams so it has lost approximately 14.3 14 14 grams. grams. Now, remember, the grams is grams are equal to mils. So if you did this in milliliters of water, in addition to grams, if you wanted to do the liquid version, it would be 14.3 milliliters of water that it's lost. Let's do syrup. Oh, that was syrup. All right, Pert, I'm gonna let you hold. All right. So now I'm gonna do the water egg. And what do you think this one's gonna do? Drop that one in the comments for us. It was 78.6 when we started. So drop a number, where, where do you think it's gonna be now? By the way, on that syrup egg, while y'all are commenting, I don't let them mass it until the end and tell them to be really careful if they rinse them off, you don't wanna pop the eggs. But we always have some in reserves. Water goes in, higher. Increase maybe five, five to 10, 10 mils, five, 10 grams. All right, let's see what we got, Pearl. We started right. at 89, we started at 78.6. And now we've got 82.8. So we are almost four grams up, or four mils up. So if you are a science teacher, you would tell a kid, okay, so let's say. And they're back in their little water bottles. They're baths. back in their little water bottles. We'll mass them again. All right, y'all listen to her talk. I'm gonna put y'all back on the stand. So if we're doing this in an actual science lab, and we're talking about kids and we're like, why in the world do you give a rip about cell membranes? Well, I give a big rip about cell membranes because water is the universal solvent and it's absolutely essential for life. So if you are talking about water in a plant cell, you would say without the water, these plants aren't gonna make it. And if you're in an animal cell, those cells still need to be in an environment where they've got a lot of <laughs> and wrote, if I sit in a vat of Cairo, can I lose weight? Uh, that is a legit question. If you are on the cellular level, you can, but. For I'm me, willing to make a hypothesis and test this out at home. <laughs> from the obnoxious science teacher point of view, you could say, all right, we start at the uh, atoms, make molecules, molecules make macromolecules, macromolecules make organelles, which make cells. Cells make tissues, which make organs, which make organ systems, which make organisms. So we're way over here on the organismal level and not on the cell level. We're more on, so it really affects cells, but it would eventually affect the organismal level. And the reason I know this is because I've heard stories about people that's boat capsized in water and they're floating in the ocean. And I've actually heard things about like people's skin peeling off and gross stories like that. So. I would not recommend the k syrup syrup vat, but hey, you do you, Ann. <laughs> hey, I might join Ann. We're gonna do a k syrup syrup vat. No judgment here, sister. <laughs> so at the halfway point, you can see that that's what's happened so far. And the cool thing about this is you don't really see visually yet, like they looked a little different, but if you leave these things over a few days, 
And I'll try to leave these. Well, I don't really want to leave them out because we probably won't be here tomorrow. But that syrup egg will actually shrivel to where the yolk is actually hard. And then I'll let the kids have them in a Ziploc bag and they can poke them and play with them and make sure, make sure you put them in a Ziploc bag. You don't want egg yolk, vinegary egg yolk on folks' pants. On, as I would say, on y'all, on Ewan's pants. And so you just don't want to get vinegar on your pants. And so that you can actually see. We'll do this again at the end of our lab. But right now, Laura is going to talk about milk and butter. All right, so I'm going to scoot this back just a little bit so, so I'm not all up in your grill. You know, you have that one kid who's always up in your grill and it's You're obnoxious. Like, you like, honey, you got to step back. At least we have corona now to be like, honey, I need my six feet. Because everybody has that one kid. You know, I'm right. <laughs> All right, well now I'm prepped and I'm ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. So if you have your book, your alphabet soup book, and you want to flip with me, I'm gonna be on the letter B. B for butter. So I'm right here. Okay. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're going to get yourself some little condiment cups. Now, I know that that book says to get you a glass jar and put some heavy whipping cream in it and put some marbles in it. Maybe you don't teach the same kids I do and you trust them with that jar. I don't. So I'm all about the condiment cup. If I'm being honest, I prefer the kind that are the ones that you get ketchup in. And so they're a little bit shorter and they're a little bit more round, but this is what we have and this is what we're going to use. So get yourself some heavy whipping cream and you're going to fill it about halfway up. And if you fill it more than halfway up, it's going to start to slosh everywhere. We don't want that. So Ziploc bag, mm, zip bag too. You can get the shorter ones at Dollar Tree. Yes, ma'am, you can. We, uh, we get ours at the Sam's Club because like we talked about earlier, Leah and I are hoarders. We do us a one Walmart run and August and we pull like a thousand dollar PO and we're like, I need all the vinegar and I need all the alcohol, which is how we had that for DNA earlier today. So we put it in the cup and then this is going to be how you figure out which ones of your boys did because as they start shaking it like this, some of them will start having the finger flop going. All right, so you're going to shake, 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 and then time lapse. After you shake for a while, it's gonna turn into, oh wait, camera's on that side, and it's real bright. Can I turn that off for a second, hold on. Can y'all see that better now? Okay, so as you can see, it's gonna turn into this, it's not really milk anymore, it's kinda thickened, all right? And that's how we get things like Cool Whip and heavy whipping cream. And if you keep going for a little while, man, that ring light behind us makes a huge difference. Okay, so then you're going to keep going. And eventually, it's going to turn into this butter substance. And I can pour off the liquid part, which is what we call the what? Remember, little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her. That's right, eating her curds and whey. Glory's with me. So we've got our curds and whey in here. Now you can do other fun stuff, like you can add salt to it. You can add, I'm gonna turn that back on because I liked my movie star look with the light on. There it is. Okay, you can add salt to this, but we use crackers that are already salted. So you can get you a butter cracker as I break my cracker right here. And it's delicious. I'm a dairy girl, so I love butter. If I'm gonna die of something, it's gonna be of eating butter. So I love it. All right, and then what's left in here is our whey, okay? So let's look at our different types of milk, okay? So first off, if you drink some type of milk alternative, go ahead and drop that in there. Maybe you drink coconut milk, or maybe you drink almond milk, or maybe it's um, soy milk, whatever that is. If you're one of those people, drop it below for me. Can y'all see my green marker? I don't feel like I can. I'm gonna use a 
darker color. Purple it is. I just wiped Cairo all over my board from where Leah wiped her hands on that egg. All right, Casey, do we have any soy drinkers? So we've got a few almond people. Okay, okay. All right, so Fair Life is actually um, from Fair Oaks Dairy, and they are just north of Chicago. So um, that's that's more of a brand. That's not a type of milk. Okay. All right. Have I got anybody in here that is a skim milk drinker? Can you raise your hand for me? You skim milk drinkers? All right, Miss Debbie. I see you. I see you. All right. We got any two percenters? Yeah, all right, so we got a couple of those. All right, I got a thumbs up from Kimberly too. Okay. 2% and goat milk. Now see, why would we waste goat milk? We need to make that into queso, because I need some queso in my face, so I love queso. All right, uh, anybody in here a whole milk drinker? Brooke, yeah, team whole milk, I love it. All right, all right, so we got some more whole milkers in here, okay? So when we're talking about milk, we're gonna look on the side of the carton and we're going to, yeah, Chris, all right, so we're gonna look on the side and there's typically two things that we look at when we look at the side of a milk carton. So what are the two things you look at? Drop them below for me when you're trying to figure out milk. Usually people look at the caps because they know the colors by now, but what do you look at? Sugar, the date. Uh, the date. <laughs> That's excellent. I appreciate that. Okay. So what we're looking at, a lot of times when we look at the color cap, we pretty much know that red is whole milk. We know that blue is 2%. And usually that pink or purple cap is going to be our skim milk. And then otherwise we have to look at the box to see what those milk alternatives are like our soy milks and our almond milks. Okay. So we have our percentages, okay? So does anybody know what percent fat you find in lactate since I'm old? Oh, yep. <laughs> All right. Does anybody know what percent fat we find in things like soy milk or almond milk? Any guesses? I don't see anybody taking a stab in the comments, and that's okay. So usually in 4%, oh, okay, okay. We're a little bit high, but that's all right. You're not too far off. So in soy milk, usually we have about 1.6% fat. Google is not always right. That is the correct answer. Okay. What about skim milk? What percent fat do we find there? Any ideas? Excellent. Now, actually, it can be zero to zero point four percent to meet USDA regulations. Okay. Looking on the box, that's right. Okay. So you look on the box and you see skim milk is going to have as close to zero percent as the uh, processor can possibly get it before they put it into the jug. All right. Now I'm asking an easy one. I need everybody to answer. What percent fat is in two percent milk? Ready, go. No. Oh, Susan beat everybody to the punch. It's two percent. All right. Now, trick question. What percent fat do we find in whole milk? What you got? Oh, maybe Google is close to right this time. Okay, so the USDA allows whole milk to have between 3.5 and 3.75% fat. Okay, now a lot of times we're going to ask ourselves, well, why is this important? Why do we need to know how much fat is in our milk? Well, after we had changes to our school nutrition lunch programs, 
we saw 1.1 million students stop drinking milk. That's a lot. So I live on a dairy farm and my child is an avid milk drinker, or at least my six year old is. My four year old's all about the chocolate milk. Me too. So he came home and he was like, I just drink a high C or a Gatorade or a Capri Sun. And so I started trying to ask why, and he said it's because the milk there tastes awful. And so I started thinking about it, and it's because when they're at school, they're drinking skim milk. Okay, so the CDC, which we've heard a lot from here lately, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, have done research and they suggest that, stu that children under the age of two drink whole milk, okay? So under the age of two, okay? So they have found and done research that proves that whole milk or that extra fat helps them with frontal lobe development. And what does our frontal lobe of our brain do, okay? That's our main processor. That's where we think, that's where we learn, that's where we retain knowledge from. And children that drank 2% did better academically, and not 2% drank whole milk, did act better academically. So then they followed them to see if it had any other effects on them. Well, it turns out that whole milk and all that extra fat helps them to prevent future diseases as well. So things like diabetes, or um, obesity, okay? And if it's something as simple as just giving them milk to drink, then we're a, hey guys, I don't know if you can see it, but our IT guy just came in, which we could have used this morning. Hey! What's up? Hey! What's up? So we're doing a workshop across Tennessee, a virtual workshop about agriculture in the classroom. Everybody say, hey, Billy. What's up, people? So yeah, you here to help us out with the techno? I'm taking down your internet. I'm just kidding. Oh, especially like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susan Reese says hello. Hello, Susan Reese. He says hi. Okay. All right, so Leanne, I'm gonna see what you said. Yep. So back in 2018, they said that 1.1 million children had stopped drinking milk at school, and my child was one of them. So um, that's one of the things that's really scary, is because they're not just turning to water they're turning to other things like uh cokes which i had one this morning but i don't want my six-year-old drinking a coke you know so we've got to make sure that they're still consuming things that are good for them right so what's the other thing aside from uh milk fat that we want our children to consume with milk what's it really full of check my comments by now it is full of calcium. Um, I'm looking for something else. It's one of our major food groups. Vitamin D, also correct. It has a lot of that. Oh, I see it. Thank you, Susan. All right, so milk is really jam-packed full of protein. Can y'all see my, can y'all see my board? All right, any guesses on, how, now I'm doing all of this in grams, okay? So anybody have any idea of how much protein is in the average soy milk or almond milk? Anybody have any guesses? We're a little high there, a little high. Oh, we're real high now. Okay, so if we're looking at protein in our milks, now I'm talking about a, I'm talking about an eight ounce serving. So if you're a school teacher, you know what I'm talking about, a little cardboard where you have to open it, half the time you don't get it right, so you have to pull really hard and then restructure the little triangle at the front. Okay, so in our soy milks, or if we're talking about in our almond milks, that's okay, Miss Cleopatra, I gotcha. Yep, Ms. Thomas, that's right. Okay, so they're gonna have between 1.5 and two grams of protein. It's not a lot. 
right? But what about our other milks? And again, I'm talking about an eight ounce serving. What's our guesses there? All right, thanks for your guess. Keep on, keep on. <clears throat> Going a little higher, gotta get a little higher. Six, you're getting closer. Yeah, all right, good job. So, no matter the type of milk, they all have eight grams of protein. So when we take the fat out, we're not taking out the protein too. We're just using what we've got and the protein that comes in them. So even though our students are drinking skim milk at school, they're still getting eight grams of protein. And what does protein help our bodies do? It helps our bones to grow bigger, helps our muscles to grow stronger. Um, it just helps us in the overall growth process. And proteins do a lot of other things like help with our, do what? Yes, it does help us stay full. That's why I have me some chocolate milk in the morning. All right, so eight grams of protein no matter what type of milk you drink. So, that's really important, and that's something you can share with your students when you're looking at making butter, okay? Now, for our ELA people, um, my name is Laura, so can you guess who my favorite author was when I was a child? She's another Laura. Anybody, anybody? <gasps> yes, Laura Ingalls Wilder, yes, she's my fave. Okay, so I heard Leah talk a little bit earlier about her macromolecules, so, which macromolecule is butter? Does anybody know? Checking down here to see the comments. That's right, it's a fat. And how do we test fats? Well, we do it with a brown paper bag. So for me, I get my click list groceries, put it in my car, and then put my frozen stuff in a brown paper bag, and it's free to me, and I cut it up. Now, usually when I'm doing this in my lab, I use smaller pieces of bag because it needs to go further, but I have a really big piece so that you can see it on camera. So we're testing for fats. So when you test for a fat, you use a brown paper bag and I've got some butter. Just take it right out of my jar on my finger. And I'm gonna put it right here on my bag. All right, and I'm gonna rub it in really good. And what do you notice that my bag is starting to do? It's turning brown, okay? Now, let's see if I can turn on a flame. Yep, it's getting shiny too. And this light's kind of throwing it for a loop. Let me see if I turn it off if it helps any. Okay, can you see how it's also kind of starting to turn translucent as well? Okay. So if we go back to Laura Ingalls Wilder and her time out on the prairie, you've probably read this before if you're a Laura Ingalls Wilder fan. So they used to make their windows out of butcher paper or out of brown paper. So they would have holes in their walls and they would take this to make windows and they would patch it up on the side where their windows would be. And to make it more translucent, they would rub lard on it. Does anybody remember what animal that they got their lard from in her book? A lot of people t say pigs, but that's not correct. Any guesses? Oh, deer is another good guess, but they actually got it from a bear that they killed. So if you're an ELA teacher, and I had some great ELA teachers when I was in elementary and middle school, and they taught me to love reading because they taught me to read about what I enjoy, and then they helped me to apply that to something that I did enjoy. So what I did enjoy at that time was agriculture, and so they helped me to be able to see things like this, and that's what we've got to do as teachers. If we're in agriculture, we've got to help our children learn to read. And that's by helping them learn about something they're interested in. So maybe they need to be reading about marine biology. Maybe they need to be reading about, if it's my child, they need to be reading about tractors. Okay. And they also need to learn how to read for information. And so this was one thing that my teacher helped me to understand. 
was that it was fat out of the milk that my family was producing, just like the bear in Laura Ingalls Wilder. And that was how they made their windows. So I thought that was fun. Um, that's not in your curriculum. That's just an extra freebie for you. Okay. All right. So it is 12 o'clock. So thank you. I thought so too. All right. So it is almost time for our scheduled lunch break. Um, so we have a total of 33 minutes left in our uh, 6 through 12 breakout session. So how long of a lunch break do we want to take? I'm going to defer to Lee. What do we have total? We have uh, 33 minutes left in this breakout. Well, we would like to thank Domino's Pizza for delivering our lunch to Spring Hill High School today. It was delicious, and we sucked that down in 10 minutes. And, you know, most people don't understand the 10-minute lunch, but I bet all y'all teachers understand the 10-minute lunch. Because that's just about what you get after you drag everybody's tail down there and then drag everybody's tail back. Because even high schoolers, we're supposed to drop them off and pick them up. So that's what we've got. So the activity that I'm doing next is out of the investigating plants manual. And there's two of them that I've got prepped. And they're lab one and lab two. Now, if you read the beginning of this lab book, I don't even know where it came from. We've had it for 100 years. But it says hands-on, low-cost laboratory exercises in plant science. These are just a really simple, easy, good activities. And if you're like me and you've got scalpels and whatnot to dissect with, you're good. But if you don't have scalpels, you're good too. Uh, so today I'm just using paper plates and plastic knives. And so um, we're going to start with our first, which is flower anatomy, which is lab number one. And of course, it gives you, uh, in, you know, the educational opportunities. It gives them a little bit of a background in flowers. And of course, you think, well, I don't really have flowers as a part of my curriculum, but I do have reproduction as a part of my curriculum. And so if you have, um, you know, reproduction as a part of your curriculum, or even if you're teaching the life cycles of plants, then this is, this is the lab you're going to want to be doing. We have a big bunch of, of uh, lilies, tiger lilies, or they, I guess they're day lilies that are in front of the school and they were every one a goner. So I'm thankful that my husband picked me a zinnia at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center yesterday because if I did not have my sperm station flower, I would have nothing to dissect this morning because those lilies out front were a goner when I got here. So what you're gonna do is, you'll notice it says the materials you need, complete flowers, Complete flowers means it has both male and female parts on it. So if you'll notice a complete flower, you've got the male part, which is the yellow right in the middle. That's the anther and the filament. The yellow is the pollen grain. And the pollen grain represents the male sperm of the plant. And then a complete flower also has the female portion. And in this plant, the female portion is located right up under here. So this is a complete flower because it's got both male and female portions on the flower. And so first thing you'll wanna do is go through the anatomy of a flower with them. And the anatomy of a complete flower, this is a picture of a gladiolus, which you calls for in the lab. Well, I'm not paying for glads at the florist. You can forget that. I'm getting whatever I can get for free. And that is usually a tiger lily or a day lily or anything I can find. The zinnias aren't as good with the male parts because they don't stick up as high as a lily does, but hey, you roll with it and use what you got. And so on this particular lab, you have got, um, if you'll notice, it's got the directions are right on here and the discussion ideas and questions are right there. It's a really, really great little activity to do. So it says obtain the flower, draw the flower and label the parts and carefully dissect with a razor blade. That's a hot no in my younger kids' classes. Uh, I don't even use a razor blade with my high school kids to do this. I use a plastic knife, and I'm trying to locate the plastic knife which I, which I set out. One second. And so you need a paper plate and a plastic knife. All right. So with that particular activity, we'll go on with the lab. It says examine the part with a lens and a microscope. 
With the microscope, you can usually see the pollen grains. It's gonna be hard to see this with a compound microscope, but if you've got a dissecting scope at your school or a little simple, simple microscope, you might actually be able to see structures up under here. And so it says, draw the flower, carefully dissect. Now I'm gonna take this off and I am going to flip it. And I'm gonna show you the little zinnia that I have right here. And basically what you're gonna do, it's even easier if you remove the little petals because they can actually see the reproductive structures. So I'm gonna set this down for two seconds and remove my petals. So now we have the basic reproductive structures of my flower. You can see the anther and the filaments, which are these little parts right here sticking up. That's the male part. If you rub the yellow on your finger, you can actually, I don't know if I can see it right here, but I'll let Casey hold it and see if I can get some on my finger. And you can actually get the little yellow pollen grains. Let's see if I can scrape some off on the knife. And you can actually see the little yellow pollen grains. That's the plant sperm. And so what you do with the lilies is you're just going to take the flower and just cut it straight in half to make a cross section with your plastic knife. So now this works great with a lily, not as great with the zinnias but it's what I had at the end of July you know you roll with the flow so now you can see the male parts are the anther and the filament which are these guys that stick up now somebody on the comment page tell me why the anther and filament slash male part slash plant sperm is higher on the plant than the female part which is down here think about your B curriculum that we sent home with you somebody put a comment in there as to why male part is usually up above the female part. And even on the book, you could see that the male part would stick up. There's the anther and the filament. Pollination, excellent. Thank you, Lori. And Garrett, well, it's not Garrett. I don't remember what you said your first name was, but Debbie. Debbie, yeah. Because the male part sticks up. You want those pollen grains in a complete flower to fall down into the female part. So the male part is the anther and the filament up here. The female part is called the stigma, style, and ovary. As a unit, it's called the stamen. Stigma, not stamen. It's called the uh, stigma, style, ovary. The stamen is actually the male part with the anther and the filament. So the sticky stigma grabs those pollen grains and it makes an actual tube down into the ovary. So stigma's up here at the top. Then as you move down, it goes to the style, which is basically the, what you would think of as the fallopian tube in a female, down into the ovary or the ovule, ovary where the ovules are housed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a pollinator, you're up here, you know, mm, yummy pollen and get your little beehive in and your little bee pollen. And then he shakes his little bee butt on the next flower and pollinates the next flower. And so that is a simple flower anatomy lab. And like I said, if you've got lilies, they work way better because you can actually, as you get down into the ovule of the lily, once you do a cross section, there's actually little white eggs down in there. So you can actually take your little knife or you can take a dissecting needle if you've got one. And then down here in the ovule of the lily, you can, they can dig out those little white eggs. What I would like to do if, if I had an older kid class was take a little pollen grain and um, you can actually put that pollen grain in some sugar water and then put it on a glass slide, usually a depression slide that's got a little dip in it. And it'll actually grow an extension out of that little yellow round pollen grain. And it's called a pollen tube because that pollen tube actually grows an extension of itself down into the ovule to fertilize the flower. Stuff like that, you don't think of doing in class. It costs nothing. And it is a tremendous little lab. You go get lilies out in your front yard and you've got sugar water that you can just make in your lab. 
It's a great lab to show you. It's very little time. And the next one I'm gonna hustle through so Laura can make ice cream with you all is seed anatomy. It's kind of the same type of lab and it gives you an actual lab on seeds. It's got a peanut seed over here. You can get raw peanuts if you want to do it that way or corn right here. What I've actually done is I germinated two seeds I had at my house. This was pinto beans that I just dug out of the pantry. And you can see that I've germinated them in a Ziploc bag. This is very scientific. Ziploc bag, water, wet paper towel. Woo -woo! Right here is a red bean because my, my UT senior loves red beans and rice. And both of them, you can see, have actually germinated with that water in that Ziploc bag. I put these in here, not before last. So that's all it took. And so with this seed germination lab, it actually goes through the part. You can see that a seed is like, it's like an embryo. And when that water comes in, it causes that seed to germinate. And so you can actually see inside that plant, you can see the radical shooting forth. And that radical, that little curved thing you saw on the end of my seed is going to grow down to become the roots. And then it's going to shoot up to become the stems. And so it actually has a series of questions that you can ask in that lab. What have we learned? What's the importance of seeds? And you could talk about maybe making a seed bank in your classroom. This is not something you have to buy. Go buy, uh, you know, pick an ear of corn off of the ear this summer. Let it dry. Use the corn you've got. Go get pinto beans out of your pantry. Use them. Not something you have to spend two dimes on. And it really is a great lab to help them to understand how plants reproduce. And so that is it for my labs today. Thank you all. Laura has got a lab on ice cream, how to make ice cream in your class. Our chemistry kids love this lab and her physical science kids did. Um, before so. we go to ice cream, because I've still got about nine minutes, um, I wanted to show you this to go along with her seeds. So if you're working on sequencing or something like that with your kids, or maybe even reading a story, um, like with investigating plants, I've got a cotton bowl. So on the Google Drive or on your CD, we have layouts for this. Um, what are they called? They're not layouts. They're called the things you copy. Templates. Templates. And you copy those and you cut them out. So we've got another one for a pumpkin, which is really fun to do if you're doing seed life cycle, uh, plant life cycles. But I just have a cotton one. I don't have a pumpkin one, but it is on your CD. And so what it is is you just take a paper plate and it's got the template for the bowl down here and you just draw your little line and then you pull out the pieces of your life cycle so everything starts with a seed and then from there you grow a leaf after the leaf you have a bud still the same thing on a pumpkin and from the bud opens up a flower. So you can talk about this when you're doing your flower dissection that Leah just showed you. Now, this is an extra step you'll have on cotton that you won't have on your pumpkin, but then you're gonna have what they call a bowl, like a cotton bowl. And then you have your cotton. So that's just something that's real quick and real easy. Something you could maybe leave with a sub um, that you could trust your kids to do with or your kids to do while you're gone. And all it takes is you making the copies, maybe on different colored paper, a whole punch and some yarn. Real quick and easy, okay? But now, as promised, I'm gonna show you how to make ice cream. So if you have your alphabet soup book again, uh, if you want to turn to either K for kick the can or R for rock and roll ice cream, this is kind of a combination of the two of them. And with ever, the way everything's going, it might just be easier. Should be short, I'm gonna pull that up. Nope, I gotcha. Uh, it might be easier just to kind of modify it this way. So that way you're not sharing as much as you would as the way it's written in your alphabet soup book. I'm just like. Okay. So what you're gonna start with is get yourself two baggies. I actually have three because as I was shaking, my big baggie busted. Okay. <clears throat> and all you're gonna do is fill a bag with some rock salt and some ice. 
And I like to use gallon bags because what I would do is when I would make my smaller bags, I could have my kids put two of each of these in a gallon bag. And when their hands got cold, they could trade off shaking. And that way there's not as much waste either. Okay, now in your books, it has the recipe for vanilla, but um, I wanted to do chocolate because I love chocolate. So <clears throat> what you do for that one for chocolate <clears throat> is one cup of heavy whipping cream, pour it off in your bag, one cup. And then on, I got chocolate milk and I was trying to support some of my Tennessee farmers, Tennessee dairy farmers, so I got purity. <clears throat> and you pour one cup into your bag as well. So you pour one cup and one cup. Can alternative milks be used? So no, actually on this, this one, you need to use a whole milk because remember that fat content I was talking about earlier? So you need to have a higher fat content milk. So chocolate milk has, I think it's 4%. Or less like soy milk? Mm-hmm. This one has, this one is 4% fat and whole milk is almost 4% fat. So you want one of those two so that the fat globules can coagulate. And what I mean by coagulate is if you were to scrape your knee like my little children do all the time and it bleeds, eventually you form a scab. And that scab is just where your blood cells have coagulated or come together to form that scab or that barrier. So you want your fat globules to coagulate and come together. So you're going to take your bag and you're going to put it inside your ice bag. <clears throat> All right. And make sure you zip it up. Sometimes you might even want to double bag this uh, for reasons in Mrs. Thompson's room that I will not say because she's going to see it a little bit and I didn't have time to clean it up. So I'm going to be over there cleaning in a minute. <laughs> Consider double bagging. <laughs> it's a big old mess. That's right. All right. So then you're just going to shake, 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 shake. I'm going to grab this rag right here. And you're just going to shake, 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 shake. And you know what I mean when I say, and all the kids are wanna, gonna wanna TikTok this. So maybe we'll let them get their phones out and TikTok about milk. All right, so check, 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 check. Now this could easily take them 10 to 12 minutes to shake it to the point of it gets to being ice cream. So then super easy, super simple. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Leah just said, make sure the day you do this, you bring some kind of towel from home or some hot pads or something. I didn't think about that because we are environmentally friendly and instead of using paper towels, we use washcloths or diapers. Um, so we just have that available. Yeah, potholders will keep hands from freezing. So then you pull your little baggie out and you get a big fat mess everywhere. And just to cut down on waste, I make them eat it out of the bag. So give them a spoon, give them a bag, tell them to go for it. It's really good. It's really, really frothy too. So on the inside of it, it's going to get really, really cold too. And on the outside, it's going to be more like a milkshake. So this works well for a lot of different um, activities as well. When you're talking about um, your macromolecules, your fats, your proteins, you can go into talking about dairy and how it offers all of those proteins, um, fats, oh, well, not DNA, but you get all of those together. Okay. You can also talk about things being endothermic and exothermic. So that has to do with physical science. So when you put your milk and stuff in here, it's warmer than the ice. So what happens is we're talking about the movement of heat. So the ice turns into water. Okay, so the temperature is rising as this one is cooling off. So this is going to be our endothermic reaction because, I'm sorry, wait a minute, I'm trying to get it backwards. Well, no, endothermic, exothermic. So this one's going to be Exo, this yeah. is endo. That's endo. It's so this is going to be up. endo because it's warming up. Wait, and that one's and exo, this is going to be exo because it's losing heat. So it, the heat is exiting. 
Okay, so exothermic right here. All right, you guys. Well, we've got a minute and a half left with you before you, the video will take you back to Chris. Um, feel free to drop any questions in there or ask anything might be quicker before we lose you. Tell them they can always find us on the Spring Hill High School website that you heard her is. All right, like she just said, if you couldn't hear her, check out Spring Hill High School if you need to contact us. And our information is also in the front of your alphabet soup book as well. We're listed right over here if you need us for anything at all. All right, well, we appreciate you and thank you for coming. Uh, Chris will be here to talk about the garden grant and he will also be telling you a little bit more about um, uh, how to get your certificates and how those are coming to you so that you can get credit for your PD sessions today. All right, well, thank you. It was great to see you. We'll be signing off. Bye. Bye.